Do you or someone that you know have small cell lung cancer? If so, you'll want to watch this video about a very exciting new protocol that is literally doubling patient life expectancy. And make sure that you hit the subscribe button so that you will stay informed. We have new videos coming out every week on all types of cancer and new tests and new treatments that are available all around the world. Hello, my name is Michelle Morand, and I'm a precision cancer medicine advocate and educator, but I'm here with the cancer guy, Alexander Roland, the expert in precision cancer medicine, and he's here to tell you a little bit about a very exciting new development for small cell lung cancer. Alex, what would you like everybody to know about this? Yes, this is a very exciting development. Small cell lung cancer has traditionally been a very difficult cancer to treat. It's often caused by cigarette smoking, but there's a variety of reasons why it's difficult to treat. And uh, this trial has addressed those. So we're going to go over the reasons for this right now. Typically, small cell lung cancers different, differ from non-small cell cancers in a variety of ways. Non-small cell are kind of the poster child of precision oncology. Uh, there's many different uh, targeted therapies for non-small cell lung cancers, probably about 10 to 14 different molecular drivers that can be targeted with targeted drugs. It's immune therapy, but small cell are kind of uh, very heterogeneous. In other words, they differ quite significantly from person to person. And the common drivers that we see in non-small cell lung cancers are not always found in small cell lung cancers. Also, based on their physiology, they're a little harder to detect, and often they don't get diagnosed until the cancer is at a very late stage, and they also tend to spread very quickly. So the standard treatment's typically just been chemo, but it has the results haven't been very good. One of the issues there is the microenvironment, and the microenvironment is the area surrounding the tumor. Small cell lung cancers have a very complicated microenvironment. It's characterized by overexpression of genes that suppress the immune system. It's also characterized by a process called angiogenesis, which is basically that's the tumor uh, recruitment of blood vessels. So the tumors create their own blood vessel supply. It's kind of a leaky blood vessel supply. And that process is called angiogenesis versus neogenesis, which is the normal process of, of blood vessel uh, creation. Angiogenesis creates leaky kind of non-functioning blood vessels that don't function so well, but really promote uh, growth and metastasis. And then also vascularization. And so there's some thoughts on programming the tumor microenvironment using different drugs. And one of those drugs is what we call an anti-angiogenesis drug. And that can normalize the blood vessels so they don't leak anymore. And so it's easier for the drugs to access the tumor. Also, different immune cells can enter the tumor as well. Hopefully, we can have better what we call immune cell infiltration, where the immune cells actually get into the tumor properly. And then we could use the immune therapy drugs that work so well. So uh, this recent trial, it's called the ETER-701. What they did was they tried a anti-angiogenesis drug called anlotinib. Basically, it's a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Uh, that's not important. It's basically just a mechanism that it uses to shut down these genes. But the genes it shuts down are called the vascular endothelial growth factor receptor, which is commonly overexpressed in many cancers, the fibroblast growth factor receptor, FGFR, and also the platelet-derived growth factor receptors, they call PDGFRs, and also another one called CKIT. And so this drug typically inhibits those. And then they added this to the standard immunotherapy and the chemotherapy. And what they got, it resulted in the longest progression-free survival and overall survival in the first line setting of advanced and extensive small cell lung cancers. And we've never seen these kind of results before. Wow. So in this trial, they used a drug called Benmelstobart. It's one of the new PD-1 inhibitors. I don't know a lot about that specific drug, but PD-1 inhibitors target the PD-1 program death one cascade, which is a pathway that tumor cells use to suppress the immune system and prevent it from attacking them. So this is a PD-1 inhibitor, and they combined that with and lotinib plus two standard chemotherapy drugs for this type of cancer, etoposide and carboplatinum. And they've both been around for a while. And this four drug regime actually reduced the risk of death by 39%. Importantly, the progression-free survival, which is the point in the trial when 50% of the, of the patients have had their cancer return while on the drug, exceeded six months. And it was on average, so this is an average, a median, a 6.9 months versus 4.2 months for standard chemo. The overall survival, which is basically when 50% of the patients in the trial pass away, was increased by 7.4 months. So mm -hmm. it went from 11.9 months 
you know, the average overall survival for this type of cancer with chemo up to 19.3 months, which is, you know, almost doubling. It's a real significant increase. More importantly, and, you know, the data is not mature yet, but 41.8% of patients who received the experimental combination were alive at two years versus only 24.2% who received chemotherapy alone. You know, that's a significant increase in survival. And the objective response rate, which is how many patients out of 100 respond, uh, was improved from 66.8% with chemotherapy alone to 81.3%. Oh. Um, and the duration of response has improved from 3.1 to 5.8 months. Mm -hmm. So this is really a game changer for this type of cancer. I would suggest that there's a variety of different drugs that can achieve this. I think the results of this is all about targeting the microenvironment with a VEGF inhibitor and an angiogenesis inhibitor and combining those four drugs together. So in other words, having the four different arms approach it at the same time. And this is a theme that we see a lot with difficult cancers is it's really just a matter of having more drugs to target more of the escape mechanisms rather than increasing the dose of the drugs. And I suspect if they were to replace anilotinib with cabozantinib, for example, they would probably get a significant better response. There's probably a trial out there for that somewhere. Yes, right? I'm sure there is. There's a variety of different drugs you could use in this setting to target that microenvironment in the same way this trial did. So the side effects, obviously they'd be slightly increased, but any grade immune-related adverse events were 42.7%, which is not you know that high. And the grade three or higher immune-related events, adverse events, side effects occurred in 16.7% of patients. So that's pretty low. Typically, we see, you know, anywhere from 50 to 20% of patients have immune therapy-related events. It's, that's below average, believe it or not, even though this was combined with chemotherapy and another drug. So, you know, the, I think this is really good data. So the reference is there. It's mm -hmm. relatively new data. So if you have small cell lung cancer, I would definitely get on a combination similar to this. Okay, so the anti-angiogenesis drug and lotinib or some similar thing, yeah. plus the newer standard approach, which is the two chemo drugs plus the PD-1 inhibitor, exactly. that yeah. combination. And that's yeah. what we're seeing so often, isn't it? It makes yeah. total sense because cancer is so rarely driven by just one factor. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why I think many oncologists think that precision cancer medicine, you know, isn't living up to its promises because they're trying to, they're trying to, first of all, treat patients with limited genetic testing for starters. Yeah. So they don't have all the data. And then they're trying to apply, you know, one or two treatments when really there are four or five factors and they all need to be addressed. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's called functional redundancy. And it's a theme that, you know, we've humans have adopted. We've adopted it in, in transportation, like airplanes. Airplanes have multiple computers. If one computer goes down, they have other ones. They have multiple backup systems. And you need that. And so do cancers. And the reason cancers are so difficult to treat is they can use a bunch of different signaling pathways at different times. And so you need to target all of them. You need to really address all of the issues here the different signaling pathways, and make sure that you have multiple drug regimes. Yeah. And I know you've been advocating for that for over a decade. And I know that, unfortunately, it's been slow, slow going in the public health care system here in Canada and, you know, certain other countries around the world. And doctors mm. have been, the, the medical system has been very much about, let's try this one drug and see how that works. And yeah. then we'll add another or we'll do something else. And you know, all the data is pointing towards figure out the unique combinations of your genetics, what's driving mm -hmm. the bus for you, and then a combination therapy program. But this is a cool, if I may use that term associated with cancer care, idea of addressing that micro environment as well as the molecular features of the cancer. Yeah. Yeah. And it just really shows to the power of these um, angiogenesis inhibitors and why they're so important to combine with immune therapy. Yeah, because if they can stop that, the immunosuppression and they can stop the kind of the bleedy cells and the drugs can get in then and do what they're supposed to be doing, then as you were saying earlier, I don't know if you folks listening at home caught this, but you can then... You might be getting four drugs, but you're getting lower doses of these drugs as opposed to like full dose of everything. And that makes a big difference to your quality of life while you're on treatment. Most definitely. Yeah. Most definitely.
All right. So folks, if you are interested in having a chat with Alex and his team about your case specifically, if you've already had some genetic testing or you're trying to figure out how can I even how can I even get my doctor on board with this? How can I find out what is really right for me or that I'm getting the right and best treatment right now? There's a link there. Please click on it to book a consultation. And of course, hit the subscribe button on our channel. Make sure you subscribe because we have new videos on, on all sorts of stuff to do with the latest diagnostics and cancer treatments coming out every week. So we'll look forward to seeing you soon. And thank you, Alex, for sharing this. Thank you, Michelle.